attacked victims and was usually armed with a knife. He stated, you know who I am. So far, police have discovered the skeletal remains of nine and possibly ten victims. The remains of two more women. All worried and freaked out. We haven't heard from her. My whole body like shut down like I was just in shock. Usually, even the darkest, grimmest cases have some sort of resolution, as the killer is caught and answers are brought to the victims and their families. But sometimes, justice is never served. On the dusty hills of New Mexico, a killer took the lives of several young women, and the police didn't bat an eyelid at the desperate families when they declared them missing. The reason why is even more tragic. In New York, a horrible psychopath lured over a dozen victims to his home through the internet. The bodies would pile up like anyone's worst nightmares, and the media frenzy pushed the killer even further away from the police. And in Sao Paulo, Brazil, a serial killer targeted young gay men. Was this a dark ex-cop with a horrific history? Or were the police oh so very wrong? Watch on to learn about serial killers who might even be killing today. This gruesome story begins on February 2nd, 2009, when a woman was walking her dog in West Mesa, a hilly part of Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was a dusty area full of red dirt, cacti, and random rocks sticking out. But there was something else sticking out. When she took a closer look, her blood stood still. It was a human bone. She immediately called 911, and when the police arrived at the scene, they started digging. But the digging took a week. The more they dug, the more remains they'd find. By February 10th, the reality of the situation was a truly horrible one. There were 11 female bodies buried in a giant hole. The Albuquerque police had just about a thousand questions. Who had done this and when? Were they still at large? Before long, they had a name for this horrific murderer, the West Mesa Bone Collector. The police also managed to link this case to a cold case that was once assigned to a special agent named Ida. She was handling cold cases back in 2006 or 2007, and she was looking at a long list of women who had disappeared between 2003 and 2006. There was something that connected the women too. They were all illegal night workers, and they all had serious substance abuse issues. Also, all of the disappeared women used to work in a really tough area called the war zone. The first the first thing Ida did was start protecting the women working there at the time, in 2007. She made a list connecting all the disappearing cases and tried to take it to her boss, but no one took her seriously. Tragically, this often happens when disappearing cases involve illegal night workers and addicts. But in February 2009, the Albuquerque police began to take Ida's cold case seriously. Now they had uncovered 11 female bodies, and they had to extract them as carefully as they could. This was not an easy task. Hundreds of specialists came to the area, sifting through the dirt and working with their hands so as not to disturb the crime scene or any other potential remains. Some skeletons were buried eight feet deep and were in almost pristine condition, but the ones in the shallow part of the grave were scattered, bits and pieces mixed up together. It was very difficult to identify which body each bone belonged to. And imagine how gruesome that process was for the specialists involved. Finally, the skeletons reached the lab and the examiners began identifying the bodies. The first one to be identified through dental records was 26-year-old Victoria Chavez. She had been reporting missing in March 2005, but according to her family, she'd been missing for almost a year before they actually rang the police. Just like the other women on Ida's list, Victoria was a night worker, and she had problems with illegal substances. In 2004, she was on probation. By February 18th, six women had been identified. At this point, the FBI were also involved. Albuquerque police had asked for their best profilers to help identify victims, as well as catch the serial killer. But the specialists were uncovering an even grimer reality. One of the sets of remains had a smaller set of remains inside. This was the body of a pregnant woman. 
22-year-old Michelle Valdez. She'd been missing since February 2005. Her family described her as an extremely kind mom, about to be a second mom, who had dreams of becoming a singer. Unfortunately, she had recently become addicted to heavy substances and was struggling to kick the habit. Michelle had started disappearing from home for days, then weeks, then months at a time. But she would always check in with her parents via her phone, letting them know she was away or asking for money. When she disappeared and they couldn't get a hold of her, Michelle's parents rang up the police and declared her missing. But just like in the other cases, they ignored the family's pleas. It gets worse. A few months into Michelle's disappearance, her mother started hearing rumors that she'd been jabbed to death and left in the West Mesa area. This was a rough neighborhood, and people had seen something absolutely vital to the case. But when Michelle's mom went to the police crying and begging them to look into these rumors, they were once again dismissed. It simply seemed like if you hung around the wrong crowd, you weren't worthy of justice. The third woman to be identified was Cinnamon Elks. She was 32 at the time of her disappearance, so when her mother reported her missing, the police basically told her she could do whatever she wanted. She was old enough. It was through Cinnamon that the worst rumors yet were heard. Just before she went off the radar in 2004, she was telling fellow illegal night workers and friends that there was a dirty cop in the area decapitating illegal night workers and burying them in West Mesa. It was also in August 2004 that 24-year-old Julie Nieto went missing, and among other identified bodies was Monica Candelaria. She was one of the first to disappear back in 2003, and it was then that her family heard rumors that she had been and buried in West Mesa. So the rumors had been going around since the first missing cases. Imagine how many murders could have been prevented if the police had listened to the begging families. Now the Albuquerque detectives were uncovering something else. All of these women knew each other and they were all Hispanic. This meant that they probably all knew the killer personally too. The suspect pool could be getting smaller. The FBI then started working all around the Southwest tracking down potential leads and connections to this case. In the spring of 2009, another victim was identified, Doreen Marquez. She was an unusual case as she was a straight-A student who had lived comfortably all her life. In 2004, she was a mom of two and happily dating someone. But when he was sent to prison, she spiraled into a life of illegal substances. When she couldn't handle her addiction anymore, she went to prostitution. The list was getting longer. As you can imagine, when 11 bodies were uncovered, this news made the headlines all over New Mexico. Albuquerque police appeared on TV and promised justice for the victims and their families. But the police seemed at a loss about many things. First of all, they couldn't figure out the cause of death for any of the bodies. They had been decomposed for years, and the New Mexico forensics team wasn't sure how to find the cause of death in this case. They even sent the remains to a bigger lab in Texas, but they weren't sure either. In the end, the cause of death for all 11 bodies was ruled out as homicidal violence. That can mean anything. APD still won't call the West Mesa murders a cold case, but they say they also won't name any suspects involved, and they actually have a bigger pool of people they're looking at than ever before. Indeed, through 2009, the police started forming a list of suspects. One of them was Lorenzo Montoya. He had been arrested in 1999 for attempting to strangle an illegal night worker to death. And in 2003 to 2006, he lived awfully close to the large burial site in West Mesa. But here was the catch. Montoya had been in 2006 by the boyfriend of an illegal night worker he'd attacked. His death made him a prime suspect. Remember, in 2006, the murders had stopped. However, this wasn't the end of their suspect list. A second prime suspect was Joseph Blea. When the bodies were uncovered, it was Blea's own ex-wife who reported something strange to the police. Her ex-husband had a huge women's jewelry collection at home, and she had no idea where he'd gotten it from. He also had a big women's underwear collection in their backyard shed. Sheesh. He'd already been arrested for stalking institutes and indecent exposure. Then he was linked to violating a 
19 year old girl. He would spend the rest of his life in prison. Girls in the late 1980s. Investigators say Balea wore a ski mask when he attacked victims and was usually armed with a knife. Balea is also a suspect in a very large case that's gained national attention. As we've learned and reported last year, Balea is a suspect in the West Mesa murders. There was a third suspect, Scott Kimball. He was a notorious criminal who was released by the FBI in 2002 so that he could act as an informant, but he went on a killing spree instead. So there's never a time that you say, okay, I won against Scott Kimball. That's, it's gonna be an ongoing investigation with him probably for the rest of my career. He killed at least four people between 2002 and 2005 until his arrest and life in prison sentence. And in 2010, a private detective called George Walker received the creepiest phone call. He stated, you know who I am. And I said, bingo. You know who I am. I know Nina. I know who killed her. I know who, I know who did it. And I know why. Okay, bye. But as frustrating as it is, this phone call could not be tracked, and it proved to be a dead end. It could have been a prank call, someone wanting to steal the spotlight for a few seconds, or it could have been something much darker. To this day, over a decade from the discovery of the burial sites, the police are far away from tracking down the killer. In fact, there could even be more bodies out there. Between 2001 and 2006, 16 cases of disappearing illegal night workers were reported. Only 11 bodies were found. Knew that one day they could be digging again for more of the victims. The similarities are pretty close. Um, so I think any person putting this together would say, yeah, there has to be something more out there. Is the killer still at large? Did he die? Or did he move somewhere else? Still dodging the law and taking innocent lives? This next story takes us to New York City. In 2010, a routine police search on the Long Island beaches uncovered a dumping ground for one of the most gruesome serial killers known to the East Coast. So far, police have discovered the skeletal remains of nine and possibly 10 victims on this remains desk. of two more women. One has the latest shocking find along Ocean Parkway, the second discovery of human remains in just a few hours. This individual is planning these things out, and that makes him extremely dangerous. Within a few months, 11 female bodies were found. A creepy similarity with the previous case, isn't it? And it's not just the number. All women were sex workers. Sadly, there's a reason why they are especially targeted by serial killers. One of the hardest problems for a sex murderer isn't the abduction, to get a woman, to get a victim to go along with him. In prostitution, that problem is eliminated because prostitutes will go along with anybody. That's part of their job description. Slowly but surely, the bodies were identified. One of the first ones to be identified was 24-year-old Melissa Bartholomew, Lynn's daughter. When they found the bodies, we were actually watching TV, and they described, you know, about five foot tall, and we looked at each other and just started crying. We knew it was her before we even got the official phone call. Lynn remembers Melissa as an optimistic, outgoing girl. Very energetic, she was always happy. She loved to do hair and she graduated top of her school. Melissa had grown up in Buffalo and moved to New York City after graduating from high school. She kind of got hooked, all that fast hustle and bustle and she was like, wow, I can go down there and I can make a lot of money and then I can come home and I can open my own salon and buy a house. That was her dream. Lynn was a bit worried. Melissa was a young, tiny girl with no experience of living in big cities, but this was her dream and she was an adult. Eager to make quick cash and feeling the pressure of a very expensive city, Melissa turned from stripper to call girl to night worker. She advertised her services on Craigslist. This is the key clue to this case. As police uncovered the tragic stories behind all the victims, they found the Long Island Ripper's MO. He would target escorts on Craigslist. In many of these cases, there's a symbolic significance to the offender with and in their mind, they sometimes rationalize that they're ridding the world of this type of evil. Morally, he thinks he's some kind of crusader. Some of them are hyper-moralistic. And so um, 
the prostitute then symbolizes to them fear and anger and all sorts of emotions attached to sexuality. Tragically, the Long Island serial killer wasn't the first serial killer who targeted prostitutes. Throughout 30 years, Gary Ridgway, or the Green River Killer, killed 48 illegal night workers and was even proud to receive his sentence. Finally, the world knew him for who he was. They recognized his actions. For FBI profilers, these are textbook serial killers. They have two defining traits, narcissism and psychopathy. Narcissism is somebody who is incredibly egocentric and self-centered, can't get enough of themselves. Psychopathy is a little bit different. That's an individual who has no interpersonal bonding with others. This means zero empathy. They simply cannot put themselves in someone else's shoes. So they don't have a problem with taking a life, even though they wouldn't want someone to take theirs. Now the FBI had a profile they were looking for, and they could work their way toward narrowing the suspect pool. But try and do that in the Big Apple. It's a needle in a haystack. And apart from being escorts, there was nothing connecting his victims. The only clue the police could work with was a very creepy detail from Melissa's tragic story. After her death, the killer kept her phone. Then, he kept ringing Melissa's sister. Melissa's missing and we're all worried and freaked out. We haven't heard from her. And Amanda gets this call and caller ID comes up Melissa. And she answers the phone and there's a guy on the other end. Needless to say, her sister panicked, but she had no idea who this man could be. I hear a man's voice and I just like, my whole body like shut down like I was just in shock. And it wasn't just a phone call. He kept calling to the point where he was harassing her. How would you describe the conversation? Playing games with me pretty much. It was like every time my phone would ring, it was him, it was another clue to maybe getting closer to catching him. He was so confident he would never get caught, he was now getting kicks out of taunting a victim's sister. The more Melissa's sister cried and despaired, the calmer he sounded. During his last call, he admitted to killing Melissa. The police traced one of these calls to central New York in one of the busiest areas of Manhattan. Very typical, uh, this is an individual who fits right in. He looks like everybody else. Um, he's not a wild beast that you could recognize as being particularly dangerous. There was another place the police tracked the killer to. One of his other victims was Shannon Gilbert, another young worker who advertised her services on Craigslist. The last time she was seen alive was on Long Island. She was going to the killer's house. That evening, she made a call to 911, her voice shivering. But the call was made one minute too late. This is the client's house that my sister was last seen at on May 1st. And it was in here where she made the call to police? Yes, she first made the phone call to 911 in this house. What was she saying? What did she say in that call? She was saying, um, help me, help me, he's trying to kill me. It was a very obvious call and a very dark one indeed. Remember when I said the police were doing a routine check when they discovered all the bodies? They actually decided to do the check after Shannon's terrifying call. They couldn't get to her in time, and they couldn't find her body either. But they figured they might as well make sure the area is safe. If it weren't for Shannon, who knows how many more murders would have happened in Long Island. With the call tracked to the beach house, it seemed like the next logical step is to arrest whoever owned the place. But they did, and they questioned him three times. And he was cleared of all charges. Prayers go out to the families. So was the neighbor, a retired cop. In fact, everyone who was questioned was cleared of all suspicion. The police kept returning to square one. And there was another problem. The murders had taken place around 1996 and 2010. For over a decade, this killer had kept a secret burial spot that no one knew, and he knew he wasn't going to get caught. But in 2010, when the bodies were uncovered, he knew this was the end, at least for his burial place. Does that mean he fled New York when he saw the news? Is he still out there? With 16 victims uncovered and Shannon's body still missing, the picture is a really gruesome one. It feels like there's more to the Long Island serial killer and that we're so far away from the dark truth of his crimes.
Our very last story takes place in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Between February 2007 and August 2008, the police uncovered 13 brutal murders in the area of Carapicoiba. This is a bustling area of nearly half a million people, known for parties and a love for freedom. All the murders had taken place around a park known for illegal night workers and discreet hookups. But there was another catch. The victims were all men between 20 and 40 years old, and they were all gay. This is why the mysterious killer got nicknamed the Rainbow Maniac by the media. 12 of the 13 men had been shot multiple times, and one of them had passed from repeated blows to the head. And the number is not even final. In a neighboring city, the police found another three murders that they thought could be linked to the rainbow maniac. But the search for a suspect was truly tedious. Apart from being gay, the victims had nothing in common, and the police simply didn't know where to start when looking for this killer. Finally, on December 10th, 2008, they made an arrest. Former police sergeant Gairo Franco. A witness had come forward saying he'd seen Franco fatally sh one of the 13 men. After the first witness came others. Some said they had seen Franco in the area known for gay prostitution. However, after hours of questioning and months of investigation, the police concluded there was nothing that could officially link Franco to the murders. In August 2011, Franco was declared not guilty and freed from prison. The mystery remains. Was Franco the murderer? And is he walking free right now because of a breach in the law? Perhaps even corruption, as he was once a sergeant. Or were the police all wrong? And the killer was never even caught. It's a dark and worrying thought that there are so many disturbed individuals out there, including serial killers, who are hiding in plain sight. Hey, thanks for watching. Remember to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more blood-chilling true crime stories. Till next time, and you stay safe.